Chapter Fifty Seven: The Maw of the Ocean. The obsidian seas heaved underneath the dragon wing, propelling the ship high in the air. There it teetered on the precipitous crest of a foam-capped swell, before pitching forward and racing down the face of the wave into the black trough below. Billows of stinging mist drove through the frigid air as the wind groaned and howled like a monstrous spirit. Roran clung to the starboard rigging at the waist of the ship and retched over the gunwale. Nothing came up but sour bile. He had prided in himself that his stomach never bothered him while on Clovis's barges, but the storm they raced before was so violent that even Uther's men, seasoned tars each and every one, had difficulty keeping their whiskey down. It felt like a boulder of ice clouded Roran between the shoulder blades as a wave struck the ship crossways, drenching the deck before draining through the scuppers and pouring back into the frothing, furrowed, furious ocean from whence it came. Roran wiped the salty water from his eyes with fingers as clumsy as frozen lumps of wood and squinted toward the inky horizon to the aft. Maybe this will shake them off our scent. Three black-sailed sloops had pursued them ever since they passed the iron cliffs and rounded what Joad dubbed Edar Karthengov and Uther identified as Rathbar's spurred. The tailbone of the spine, that's what it be, Uther said, grinning. The sloops were faster than the dragon wing, weighed down with villagers as it was, and had quickly gained upon the merchant ship until they were close enough to exchange volleys of arrows. Worst of all, it seemed that the lead sloop worst of all, it seemed that the lead sloop carried a magician, for its arrows were uncannily accurate, splitting ropes, destroying ballastae, and clogging the blocks. From their attacks, Roran deduced that the Empire no longer cared about capturing him, and only wanted to stop him from finding sanctuary with the Varden. He had just been preparing the villagers to repel boarding parties when the clouds above ripened to a bruised purple, heavy with rain, and a ravening tempest blew in from the northwest. At the present, Uther had the dragon wing tacked crossways to the wind, heading toward the southern isles, where he hoped to elude the sloops among the shoals and coves of Beerland. A sheet of horizontal lightning flickered between two boldest thunderheads, and the world became a tableau of pale marble before darkness reigned once more. Every blinding flash imprinted a motionless scene upon Roran's eyes that lingered, pulsing, long after the brazen bolts vanished. Then came another round of forked lightning, and Roran saw, as if in a series of monochrome paintings, the mizzen topmast twist, crack, and topple into the thrashing sea, port amidships. Grabbing a lifeline, Roran pulled himself to the quarterdeck, and in unison with Bondin, hacked through the cables that still connected the topmast to the dragon wing, and dragged the stern low in the water. The ropes writhed like snakes as they were cut. Afterward, Roran sank to the deck, his right arm hooked through the gunwale to hold himself in place as the ship dropped twenty, thirty feet between waves. A swell washed over him, leeching the warmth from his bones. Shivers racked his body. Don't let me die here, he pleaded, though whom he addressed he knew not. Not in these cruel waves. My task is yet unfinished. During that long night, he clung to his memories of Katrina, drawing solace from them when he grew weary and hope threatened to desert him. The storm lasted two full days and broke during the wee hours of the night. The following morning brought with it a pale green dawn, clear skies, and three black sails riding the northern horizon. To the southwest, the hazy outline of Beerland lay underneath a shelf of clouds gathered around, gathered about the ridged mountain that dominated the island. Roran, Jode, and Uther met in a small fore cabin, since the cabin's since the captain's stateroom was given over to the infirm, where Uther unrolled sea charts on the table and tapped a point above Beerland. This should be where we are now, he said. He reached for a larger map of Allegasia's coastline and tapped the mouth of the Digiet River. And this should be our destination, since food won't last us to Reevestone. How we get there, though, without being overtaken is beyond me. Without our mizzen top gallant, those accursed sloops will catch us by noon tomorrow, even if we manage the sails well. Can we replace the masts? asked Jode. Vessels of this size carry spars to make just such repairs. Uther shrugged. 
We could, provided we had a proper ship's carpenter among us. Seeing as we don't, I'd rather not let inexperienced hands mount a spar, only to have it crash down on deck and perhaps injure somebody. Lauren said, If it weren't for the magician, or magicians, I'd say we should stand and fight, since we far outnumber the crew of the sloops. As it is, I'm chary of battle. That seems unlikely that we could prevail, considering how many ships sent to help the Varden have disappeared. Grunting, Uther drew a circle around their current position. This would be how far we can sail by tomorrow evening, assuming the wind stays with us. We could make landfall somewhere on Berlin or Nia if we wanted, but I can't see how that'd help us. We'd be trapped. The soldiers on those sloops, or the Razak, or Galvatorix himself could hunt us at his leisure. Roran scowled as he considered their options. A fight with the sloops appeared inevitable. For several minutes, the cabin was silent except for the slap of waves against the hull. Then, Jode placed his finger on the map between Beerland and Nia, looked at Uther, and asked, What about the boar's eye? To Roran's amazement, the scarred sailor actually blanched. I'd not risk that, Master Jode, not on my life. I'd rather face the sloops and die in the open sea than go to that doomed place. There has consumed twice as many ships as Gen Galvatorix's fleet. I seem to recall reading, said Jode leaning back in his chair, that the passage is perfectly safe at high tide and low tide. Is that not so? With great and evident reluctance, Uthar admitted, Aye, but the eye is so wide, it requires the most precise timing to cross without being destroyed. We'd be hard-pressed to accomplish that with the sloops near on our tail. If we could, though, pressed Jode, if we could time it right, the sloops would be wrecked, or if their nerve failed them, forced to circumvent Nia. It would give us time to find a place to hide along Beerland. If, if, you'd send us to the crushing deep, you would. Come now, Uther. Your fear is unreasoning. What I propose is dangerous, I admit, but no more than fleeing term was. Or do you doubt your ability to sail the gap? Are you not man enough to do it? Uther crossed his bare arms. You've never seen the eye, have you, sir? can't say that I have. It's not that I'm not man enough, but that the eye far exceeds the strength of men. It puts to shame our biggest ships, our grandest buildings, and anything else you'd care to name. Tempting it would be like trying to outrun an avalanche. You might succeed, but then you might as well be ground into dust. What, asked Roran, is this boar's eye? The all-devouring maw of the ocean, proclaimed Duther. In a milder tone, Jode said. It's a whirlpool, Roran. The eye forms as a result of tidal currents that collide between Beerland and Nia. When the tide waxes, the eye rotates north to west. When the tide wanes, it rotates north to east. That doesn't sound so dangerous. Uther shook his head, cue whipping the sides of his wind-burned neck, and laughed. Not so dangerous, he says. Ha! Huh. But you fail to comprehend continued Jode, is the size of the vortex. On average, the center of the eye is a league in diameter, while the arms of the pool can be anywhere from ten to fifteen miles across. Ships unlucky enough to be snared by the eye are borne down to the floor of the ocean and dashed against the jagged rocks therein. Remnants of the vessels are often found as flotsam on the beaches of the two islands. Would anyone expect us to take this route? Roran queried. No, and for good reason, growled Uther. Jode shook his head at the same time. Is it even possible for us to cross the eye? It'd be a blasted fool thing to do. Roran nodded. I know it's not something you want to risk, Uther, but our options are limited. I'm no seaman, so I must re rely upon your judgment. Can we cross the eye? The captain hesitated. Maybe, maybe not. You'd have to be stark raving mad to go nearer than five miles of that monster. Pulling out his hammer, Roran banged it on the table, leaving a dent a half-inch deep. Then I'm stark raving mad. He held Uther's gaze until the sh sailor shifted with discomfort. Might I remind you, we've only gotten this far by doing what quibbling worry words said couldn't or shouldn't be done. We of Carvajal dared to abandon our homes and cross the spine. 
Jode dared to imagine we could steal the dragon wing. What will you dare, Uther? If we can brave the eye and live to tell the tale, you shall be hailed as one of the greatest mariners in history. Now answer me, and answer me well and true. Can this be done? Uther drew a hand over his face. When he spoke, it was in a low voice, as if Roran's outburst had caused him to abandon all bluster. I don't know, Stronghammer. If we wait for the eye to subside, the sloops may be so close to us that if we escape, they'd escape. And if the wind should falter, we'd be caught in the current, unable to break free. As captain, are you willing to attempt it? Neither Jode nor I can command the dragon wing in your place. Long did Uther stare down at the charts, one hand clasped over the other. He drew a line or two from their position and worked a table of figures that Roran could make nothing, make nothing of. At last, he said, I fear we sail to our doom, but I will do my best to see us through. Satisfied, Roran put away his hammer. So be it. The sloops continued to draw closer to the dragon wing over the course of the day. Roran watched their progress whenever he could, concerned that they would get near enough to attack before the dragon wing reached the eye. Still, Uther seemed able to outrun them, at least for a little while longer. At Uther's orders, Roran and the other villagers worked to tidy up the ship after the storm and prepare for the ordeal that was to come. Their work ended at nightfall, when they extinguished every light on board in an attempt to confuse their pursuers as to the dragon wing's heading. The ruse succeeded in part, for when the sun rose, Roran saw that the sloops had fallen back to the northwest another mile or so, though they soon made up the lost distance. Late that morning, Roran climbed the mainmast and pulled himself into, up into the crow's nest a hundred and thirty feet above the deck, so high that the men below appeared no larger than his little finger. The water and sky seemed to rock perilously about him as the dragon wing heeled from side to side. Taking out the, the spyglass he had brought with him, Roran put it to his eye and adjusted it until the sloops came into focus not four miles astern and approaching faster than he would have liked. They must have realized what we intend to do, he thought. Sweeping the glass around, he searched the ocean for any sign of the boar's eye. He stopped as he descried a great disk of foam the size of an island, gyrating from north to east. Or late, he thought, a pit in his stomach. High tide had already passed, and the boar's eye was gathering in speed and strength as the ocean withdrew from land. Roran trained the glass over the edge of the crow's nest and saw that the knotted rope Uther had, tried, had tied to the starboard side of the stern to detect when they entered the pole of the whirlpool now floated alongside the dragon wing instead of trailing behind as was usual. The one thing in their favor was that they were sailing with the eye's current and not right against it. If it had been the other way around, they would have had no choice but to wait until the tide turned. Below, Roran heard Uther shout for the villagers to man the oars. A moment later, the dragon wing sprouted two rows of poles along each side, making the ship look like nothing more than a giant water strider. At the beat of an oxhide drum, accompanied by Bondin's rhythm, rhythmic chant as he set the tempo, the oars arched forward, dipped into the sea of green, and swept back across the surface of the water, leaving white streaks of bubbles in their wake. The dragon wing accelerated quickly now, moving faster than the sloops, which were still outside the eye's influence. Roran watched with horrified fascination the play that unfolded around him. The essential plot element, the crux upon which the outcome depended, was time. Though they were late, was the dragon wing, with its oars and sails combined, fast enough to traverse the eye? And could the sloops, which had de deployed their own oars now, narrow the gap between them and the dragon wing enough to ensure their own survival? He could not tell. The pounding drum measured out the minutes. Roran was acutely aware of each moment as it trickled by. He was surprised when an arm reached over the edge of the basket, and Baldor's face appeared, looking up at him. Give me a hand, won't ya? I feel like I'm about to fall. Bracing himself, Roran helped Baldor into the basket. Baldor handed Roran a biscuit and a dried apple and said, Thought you might like some lunch. With a nod of thanks, Roran tore into the biscuit 
and resumed gazing through, through the spy gas. When Baldor asked, Can you see the eye? Roran passed him the glass and concentrated on eating. Over the next half hour, the foam disc increased the speed of its revolutions until it spun like a top. The water around the foam bulged and began to rise, while the foam itself sank from view into the bottom of a gigantic pit that continued to deepen and enlarge. The air over the vortex filled with a cyclone of twisting mist, and from the ebony throat of the abyss came a tortured howl like the cries of an injured wolf. The speed with which the boar's eyes formed amazed Rorn. "'You'd better go tell Uther,' he said. Baldur climbed out of the nest. "'Tie yourself to the mast or you will may get thrown off. I will.' Rorin left his arms free when he secured himself, making sure that if needed— he could reach his belt knife to cut himself free. Anxiety filled him as he surveyed the situation. The dragon wing was but a mile past the median of the eye. The sloops were, sloops were but two miles behind her, and the eye itself was quickly building toward its full fury. Worse, disrupted by the whirlpool, the wind sputtered and gasped, blowing first from one direction and then the other. The sails billowed for a moment, then fell slack, then filled again as the confused wind swirled around the ship. Perhaps Uther was right, thought Rorin. Perhaps I've gone too far and pitted myself against an opponent that could not be overcome by sheer determination. Perhaps I am sending the villagers to their deaths. The forces of nature were immune to intimidation. The gaping center of the boar's eye was now almost nine and a half miles in circumference, and how many fathoms deep no one could say except for those who had been trapped within it. The sides of the eye slanted inward at a 45-degree angle. They were striated with shallow grooves, like wet clay being molded on a potter, potter's wheel. The base howl grew louder, until it seemed to roar that the entire world must crumble to pieces from the intensity of the vibrations. A glorious rainbow emerged from the mist over the whirling chasm. The current moved faster than ever, driving the dragon wing at a breakneck pace as it whipped around the rim of the whirlpool and making it more and more unlikely that the ship could break free at the eye's southern edge. So prodigious was her velocity, the dragon wing tilted far to the starboard, suspending Roran out over the rushing water. Despite the dragon wing's progress, the sloops continued to gain on her. The enemy's ships sailed abreast less than a mile away, their oars moving in perfect accord two fins of water flying from each prow as they plowed the ocean. Burn could not help but admire the sight. He tucked the spyglass away in his shirt. He had no need of it now. The sloops were close enough for the naked eye, while the whirlpool was increasingly obscured by the clouds of white vapor thrown off the lip of the funnel. As it was pulled into the deep, the vapor formed a spiral lens over the gulf, mimicking the whirlpool's appearance. Then the dragon wing tacked port, diverging from the current in Uther's bid for the open sea. The keel chattered across the puckered water, and the ship's speed dropped in half as the dragon wing fought the deadly embrace of the boar's eye. A shudder ran up the mast, jarring Roran's teeth, and the crow's nest swung in, a new, in the new direction, making him giddy with vertigo. Fear gripped Roran when they continued to slow. He slashed off his bindings and with reckless discard for his own safety, swung himself over the edge of the basket, grabbed the ropes underneath, and shimmied down the rigging so quickly that he lost his grip once and fell several feet before he could catch himself. He jumped to the deck, ran to the fore hatchway, and descended to the first bank of oars, where he joined Baldor and Albrecht on an oak pole. They said not a word, but labored to the sound of their own desperate breathing, the frenzied beat of the drum, Bondin's hoarse shouts, and the roar of the boar's eye. Roran could feel the mighty whirlpool resisting with each stroke of the oar. And yet their efforts could not keep the dragon wing from coming to a virtual standstill. We're not going to make it, thought Roran. His back and legs burned from the exertion, his lungs stabbed. Between the drum beats, he heard Uther ordering the hands above deck to trim the sails to take full advantage of the fickle wind. Two places ahead of Roran, Darman and Hammond, surrendered their oar to Thane and Ridley, then lay in the middle of the aisle, their limbs trembling. 
Less than a minute later, someone else collapsed farther down the gallery and was immediately replaced by Bridget and another woman. If we survive, thought Roran, it'll only be because we have enough people to sustain this pace however long is necessary. It seemed an eternity that he worked the oar in the murky, smoky room, first pushing, then pulling, doing his best to ignore the pain mounting within his body. His neck ached from hunching underneath the low ceiling. The dark wood of the pole was streaked with blood where his skin had blistered and torn. He ripped off his shirt, dropped the spyglass to the floor, wrapped the cloth around the oar, and continued rowing. At last, Roran could do no more. His legs gave way and he fell on his side, slipping across the aisle because he was so sweaty. Orville took his place. Roran lay still until his breath returned, then pushed himself onto his hands and knees and crawled to the hatchway. Like a fever-mad drunk, he pulled himself up the ladder, swaying with the motion of the ship and often slumping against the wall to rest. When he came out on deck, he took a brief moment to appreciate the fresh air, then staggered aft to the helm, his legs threatening to cramp with every step. How goes it? He gasped to Uther, who manned the wheel. Uther shook his head. Peering over the gunwale, Roran espied the three sloops perhaps half a mile away and slightly more to the west, closer to the center of the eye. The sloops appeared motionless in relation to the dragon wing. At first, as Roran watched, the positions of the four ships remained unchanged. Then he sensed a shift in the dragon wing's speed, as if the ship had crossed some crucial point and the forces restraining her had diminished. It was a subtle difference, and amounted to little more than a few additional feet per minute, but it was enough that the distance between the dragon wing and the sloops began to increase. With every stroke of the oars, the dragon wing gained momentum. The sloops, however, could not overcome the whirlpool's dreadful strength. Their oars gradually slowed until one by one the ships drifted backward and were drawn toward the veil of mist, beyond which waited the gyrating walls of ebony water and the gnashing rocks at the bottom of the ocean floor. They can't keep rowing, realized Roran. Their crews are too small, and they're too tired. He could not help but feel a pang of sympathy for the fate of the men on the sloops. At that precise instant, an arrow sprang from the nearest sloop and burst into green flame as it raced toward the dragon wing. The dart must have been sustained by magic to have flown so far. It struck the mizzen sail and exploded into globules of liquid fire that stuck to whatever they touched. Within seconds, twenty small fires burned along the mizzenmast, the mizzen sail, and the deck below. "'We can't put it out!' shouted one of the sailors with a panicked expression. Chop off whatever's burning and throw it overboard, roared Uther in reply. Unsheathing his belt knife, Roran set to work excising a dollop of green fire from the boards by his feet. Several tense minutes elapsed before the unnatural blazes were removed, and it became clear that the conflagrations would not spread to the rest of the ship. Once the cry of, All clear! was sounded, Uther relaxed his grip on the steering wheel. If that was the best their magician can do, then I'd say we have nothing more to fear of him. We're going to get out of the eye, aren't we? asked Roran, eager to confirm his hope. Uther squared his shoulders and flashed a quick grin, both proud and disbelieving. Not quite this cycle, but we'll be close. We won't make real progress away from that gaping monster until the tide slacks off. Go tell Bondin to lower the tempo a bit. I don't want them fainting at the oars, if and I can help it. And so it was. Roran took another shift rowing, and by the time he returned to the deck, the whirlpool was subsiding. The vortex's ghastly howl faded into the usual noise of the wind. The water assumed a cl calm, flat quality that betrayed no hint of the habitual violence visited upon that location. And the contorted fog that had writhed above the abyss melted under the warm rays of the sun leaving the air as clear as oiled glass. Of the boar's eye itself, as Roran saw when he retrieved the spyglass from among the rowers, nothing remained but the self-same disk of yellow foam rotating upon the water. And in the center of the foam, he thought he could discern, just barely, three broken masts and a black sail floating round and round and round 
in an endless circle. But it might have just been his imagination. Leastways, that's what he told himself. Elaine came up beside him, one hand resting on her swollen belly. In a small voice, she said, We were lucky, Roran, more lucky than we had reason to expect. Aye, he agreed. 